We actually spoke at the barbecue last night, so I think we've already had a, a great introduction um, to, oh, sorry, um, to Associate Professor Ray Carney. So today we're going to get further enlightenment um, on his wonderful knowledge uh, that he's accumulated over many years. I think it's about the only good thing about getting old. You seem to accumulate um, some wisdom, we hope, uh, because there's not much else in it, I don't think. But as long as we can spread that to other people and make it worthwhile. Now, I'm sure after a talk like that, if you go back to your action list, there might be a few actions you put on it. So while I'm getting Ray's presentation up, um, just run back and maybe write something down that you're going to do for yourself. And I'll just get his slides up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rhonda. And good, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for the opportunity to share with you the observations that we're going to address in dealing with this topic of toxins. <coughs> Obviously, we can only focus in on certain aspects of it. We can't uh, deal with it in great depth. Graham has already covered uh, much of that in great detail, and I won't be covering that same area. I will be dealing, to some extent, with some of the politics behind the current situation. <laughs> Sorry, what happened there? Um, just side to side. Oh, that no. one. Sorry. Mm. There we go. <clears throat> I go to nature to be soothed and healed and have my senses put in tune once more. My wife and I, we share a lot of time with our children in earlier times, before they were married, to teach them to appreciate the world in which we live. And we would capture photographs and those photographs became a record in their album. We couldn't put names to them. So we joined the Sydney Fungal Studies Group and we've taken an interest in all sorts of things, not only fungi, but orchids, etc., etc. We're greatly inspired by the interdependency of species, and you as farmers are greatly aware of that. Here we have an example of an orchid that has fungi in the soil. The seeds won't germinate because the seeds don't have enough food in them. So they depend upon mycorrhizal fungi to germinate. For pollination, this particular orchid mimics the female wasp. And so the male comes along thinking he's on a winner and tries to copulate. And in the process, the back of the um, Wasp touches the knob of superglue, which is attached to the pollinia. And he leaves, depositing his semen behind. But that's all the orchid wants, is for him to take away the pollen, to cross-pollinate, etc. We were trying to teach one of our grandchildren a little bit about metamorphosis. And we have a citrus fruit that grows in the front of our place. And we noticed that one of the species of butterflies had laid an egg. So this was our chance to record for the children this life cycle. How disappointed we were. When it got to the stage of the caterpillar undergoing metamorphosis, we captured the sequence on and on and then Suddenly, there were symptoms of infection. The infection was due to a fungus belonging to the genus Microsporidium. Microsporidium is no doubt familiar to you. There are many different genera within this group of Microsporidia and there are many different species. Some of those species do infect human beings. Some of them 
infect insects and indeed some of the species are used as insect controllers such as locusts. In our research we found that 35% of the fruit juices that can be imported in this country are contaminated, not only with microsporidium, but also with other organisms as well. We brought this to the attention of Aquas, though not interested. Free trade opens up the doors, and these are some of the risks, no doubt, to our pollinators in this country. Free trade, giant corporations, not governments, are the main actors behind global trade, and you know that full well. When labour and regulation costs are too high for competitive uh, super profits, corporations leave their country to exploit slave labour of poor countries, and that's happening at this very moment. The United States considers fair trade to mean the dominance of US corporations, Monsanto, for example, and more. And today, we'll touch on this later, we are powerless in this country because of the international agreements that allow multinational corporations to come into this country and override environmental laws of this country. And if we do not comply, they can sue us. And it's getting worse, as we'll see shortly. As I said earlier, we have an interest in classifying mushrooms as a hobby. We won't go into this in great deal, except that we've noticed that in certain species, they are de developing the phenomenon of rose comb. Rose comb is an epigenetic phenomenon where the gills of the mushroom form on the top of the cap as well as underneath. The analogy is thalidomide. Thalidomide did not interfere with the genetics of the baby it interfered with the decoding of the information from the DNA and the expression of that in tissue development and remodeling the formation of the limbs. That's an epigenetic phenomenon. This phenomenon is brought about by exposure to diesel fumes, products of diesel. And it's been known for many, many decades by the mushroom farmers. Don't ever bring petroleum products in contact with their mushroom farming because it induces this phenomenon of rose comb. What is the relevance of this? And are there examples? Of course there are. There are dozens and dozens of publications where these products do interfere with the development of the embryo in human beings. The prenatal exposure to the so-called polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAHs, found on small particles, interferes with that development. And so the baby is born underweight. The head circumference is below average. Epigenetic induced by external factors. Nothing to do with the gene. And here we see the mother who's pregnant and exposed to as little as 10 billionths of a gram. A nanogram. 10 billions of a gram per cubic meter of PAHs, it brings about intrauterine growth retardation. It's known about it, it's recorded, it's documented. What has been done? Nothing. Nothing. 
Again we go on. Low birth weight and preterm delivery, particularly in winter, when the air is stagnant, because the pollution is higher. Document it. Certain products, here is PCB. For goodness sake, PCB is now found to reduce the size of the thymus gland in newborn babies. The thymus is the origin of your T cells, the immune system. No, it's not affecting the genetics, but it's affecting how the gene is decoded and translated into functional activity. We're told that currently some 51% of known reptiles and 42% of known insects and 73% of flowering plants are in danger along with many mammals, birds and amphibians because of toxicity. And indeed, in some countries, in Southeast Asia for example, they're now hand pollinating certain trees fruit trees, because they don't have the pollinators that have been eliminated by the toxicity that has been spread around like bird seed. The basic criteria for health, survival. Being able to be born and to lead out a life that you're programmed right from the start but not to be handicapped by small circumference of the head, underweight, or other dysfunctional activities. Longevity, being able to live a normal lifespan, but not to be languishing in a home with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, etc. Efficiency. Being able to work and play without the haemoglobin being locked up with carbon monoxide, causing headaches, delays past tiredness, etc., and well being. Well being. For example, not to be bothered by asthma episodes, crippling well being. Here are some of the metabolic disruptors of today. In June this year, the World Health Organization, in my view, has lost its credibility. Has lost its credibility. But the WHO this year, in June, declared diesel fumes to be a class one human carcinogen. And we've known it for years. It is carcinogenic. You know full well that certain genetically modified foods are proven to have adverse effects. But what is worse to come? We now have in operation at this very moment vaccines in the name of tetanus immunization. It's not the conventional tetanus immune vaccine, but tetanus toxoid coupled with human chorionic gonadotropin, the hormone needed to maintain pregnancy. Some 40% of the females in Brazil are now infertile because it's being put in to immunize those who get the tetanus. It's happening around. We'll come to that shortly. Unlimited and free access to clean air of acceptable quality is a fundamental human necessity and the right. Petroleum-based transportation fuels, the biggest polluter. The American EPA claims that uh, fossil fuels, over there is gasoline, and diesel is the largest source of man-made carcinogens. We know the causes of cancer. They declare it, confirm it, but nothing is done to remove it. Deaths from the effects of air pollution exceed 
total number of deaths from breast and prostate cancer. Shameful. In Sydney alone, three times more people die from the effects of air pollution than from road accidents. For some 100,000 synthetic chemicals are produced each year commercially. And each year, some 1,500 new chemicals are added to the list. And as we heard from Graham and others, those chemicals are not put through in proper testing. I personally failed one of the national bodies for certifying medications on the grounds that all their information for licensing came from a manufacturer. Yes, from a manufacturer. Here are some of the impacts on children by some of the toxins that Graham had already tabulated. We're not going to go through them, you've got the list before you. It is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. The cause, these effects, are already known. In terms of the pollutants from the combustion of fossil fuels, including the coarse, the fine and the ultrafine particles, the gaseous irritants, like nitrogen dioxide, the polycyclic aromatic carbons, in which many of the carcinogens do reside. I must say that my father died of cancer some 35 years ago, exposed to beta naphthylamine in the engineering workplace. Nothing has changed. And so here we have this list, this formidable list. An increased risk of cardiovascular disease. It's not the only factor. It's one of many. And on and on we go. Down the bottom, one in five lung cancer deaths are attributed to exposure to these fine particles. As I mentioned last night, the New South Wales Cancer Council don't want you to know that because it threatens their campaign against passive smoking. They lose their case in court if the community was to know that. They have no argument when one in five lung cancer cases can be due to exposure to pollutants coming from the tailpipe. And on and on it goes. Reduced male fertility. Graham has mentioned that. There are multiple factors operating on sterility today and fertility. When the Iraq fiasco broke out, initiated by America, in the belief that we were fighting terrorism, which is a con, we are there supporting Shell, ExxonMobil, and some of the bankers at like Goldman Sachs. But when they started to fire off their depleted uranium, coating the shells of their ammunition, missiles, when depleted uranium strikes concrete or metal or metal tank, 4,000 degrees it vaporizes. The uranium vaporizes into uranium oxide. And within a few days, there's a plume of radiation stretching right across to England. Another factor in sterility. Cost. We don't want you to spend time on the table too much, but on the right-hand side, the cost in Sydney alone of health impacts arising from exposure to the fine particles is approaching nine billion dollars a year.
almost 10 years ago, or over 10, 11 years ago, the director of uh, the National Industrial Chemicals Notification and Assessment Scheme warned we must reduce the levels of benzene. We don't even have a proper standard for benzene. The coal seam gas companies coming in with their toxins include benzene. Benzene is a cause of leukaemia, yet we don't have a standard that is enforceable. It's only a guideline. There's no known safe threshold for the carcinogenic effects of benzene, yet some of our children are suffering from it. There's no morality, no morality in the bureaucracies that are there to protect society. It's driven essentially by the corporate industries. Here is an informative set of graphs produced by Professor Lydia Marorska and her colleagues from Queensland, a leader, a world leader in air pollution. And what you see, we won't spend too much time here, is in petrol fumes or petrol exhaust particles, the fine particles measure less than 0.1 of a micrometer. A micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter. And these particles are less than 0.1 thousandth of a millimeter. But you see there's about 4,000 particles per cubic centimeter. But when you look at diesel, same size approximately, a little bit bigger on average, 80,000 particles per cubic millimeter. We don't have a standard for those. We don't have a standard. Published information talks about the size of the particles that are deposited in the extremities of the airways. 30% of those fine particles at that size are deposited in the gas exchange units, the alveoli. And they are soluble, offloading the cancer-causing cargo. You see, they know this, but they are willfully blinded to the truth. Why? Because of the power of the corporate sector. And further on, Professor Marorska and her colleagues made this profound statement. PM10 measurements, PM stands for particulate matter for the 10 micrometer sized particles. PM10 measurements provide information almost entirely on particles generated from mechanical processes. In an urban environment, this could mean Particles resuspended by vehicle of traffic and mechanical wear and tire of tyres. But not, not on emissions of motor vehicles. The very standard that is used to monitor air quality today is not measuring what comes out of the tailpipe. What a dereliction of duty. And they go on to say, these are not my words, these are the words of experts. All of the studies available to us demonstrate that the primary determinant of the effect of the ultrafine particles is their number and their surface area and not the weight of particles present. This means that the traditional use of PM weight measures is inappropriate in evaluation of the likely biological effects of ultrafine and fine particles. In other words, measuring the particles by weight has no relevance to health risk. To make the point, here we've got a few examples 
of different particle sizes. And let's assume the golf ball there represents one PM10 particle. Sugar representing PM0.1 particle. Let's say a particle coming out of the combustion of petrol or diesel. A, a million of those are equivalent to one of those. But the surface area is a hundred times more. But they weigh the same. Weighing particles has no relevance to health risk. And the system knows it. They are willfully blind to the truth. You are at great disbenefit. Don't be troubled by this table, except I just point to you the PAHs, the carcinogens, are confined to the fine particles as well as other toxins. The fine particles are largely soluble. You inhale them, they go all the way down to the alveoli and you offload the cancer-causing cargo. And those particles remain in the air for days to weeks. The heavy particles, they drop out very quickly. And they can travel many, many hundreds, thousands of kilometres. And basically this slide is simply saying there is no cut-off threshold for PM10 in producing no health inf impacts. But it gets worse. We demanded under FOI the tabling of documents the New South Wales Parliament. And here is just one example. A letter written by the Director General of the then EPA, it changes its name, to the Director General of Planning. And I've extracted just one statement here which is amplified. Firstly, as you are aware, the EPA reports unadjusted TEOM PM10. TEOM is just a, a means of continuously measuring the particles as opposed to filtration, capturing on a filter and measuring. This is a measure of continuous emission, pollution. That method requires the incorporation of a correction factor to get accuracy. And temperatures of 17 degrees and less requires the incorporation of that factor. They don't. And this is what she's saying. As you are aware, the EPA reports unadjusted measurements. Our consultants have advised us that unless those factors are incorporated, the government is underestimating the levels by up to 40%. And that's our government. Why? Well, the biggest polluter, of course, is the oil and car industry. Oil and car industries have acted again and again to deceive regulators about the hazards of their products and have used their wealth to hamstring attempts by state and federal legislators to make laws and address such threats. I'm very familiar with the tunnels that have been built in Sydney. I was one of the campaigners for filtration. Well, one of the consultants employed to report on the matters of air quality is also a consultant for the industry represented by the oil and car cartels. And it's that consultancy, that lobbying on the National Environment Protection Council that extinguishes those measures that are needed to protect your health. We do not have to this day a standard for fine particles. Yes, we have a reporting standard, a guideline, but it is not enforceable. 
The corporate philosophy of these industries has presented consumers from buying safer, cleaner and more sustainable fuels and transport choices. They have stunted the biofuels industry. Ten years ago I lobbied the then Prime Minister John Howard and he made a decision to turn toward biofuels on health grounds. Today the biofuels industry is being crucified by the same industries. Here is a table showing the pollutants generated in a tunnel, a traffic tunnel. And on the left hand column you can see the names of some of those chemicals, the PAHs. And then you see the particles. The particles here PM2.5, contain these carcinogens. Many of them are carcinogens. We use dimethylbenzanthracene to induce breast cancer in experimental animals. It's easy. It's only one of the carcinogens in those exhaust products. I mentioned this last night when I quoted this report one in five lung cancer deaths attributed to exposure to these fine particles and New South Wales Health Council uh, New South Wales uh, Cancer Council were very very threatened and I received a very vexatious letter from the CEO saying that you know I had no right to quote such information. And it's based on a peer-reviewed article published in 2004 involving 500,000 patients or subjects. And the conclusion was after all of the smoking and other factors were eliminated, one in five lung cancer deaths was attributed to exposure to these fine particles. New South Wales Cancer Council don't want you to know that. They want you to think the only cause of lung cancer is smoking. How wrong they are. A tumour, a millimetre in diameter, about a million cells. It demands a blood supply for further growth. We talked last night a little bit about the initiators the normal cell is transformed into a tumour cell and it can multiply. And then some of those cells will commit suicide, a phenomenon known as apoptosis, programmed cell death. And so a tumour can become dormant. But dormancy is not sleepiness. Dormancy is when the cells that are replicating are balanced by the number of cells that are committing suicide. But that balance can be quickly upset by inflammation, high lipid intake in the diet, and so on. And so you get acceleration of tumour growth. Here is another toxin, one of the fire retardants. It pro promotes proliferation of various cancer cells, particularly breast and ovary, and the female reproductive system. It reduces the anti-cancer effects of tamoxifen and inhibits apoptosis. We're all of aware of Rachel Carson's Silent Springs years ago, 1962 or thereabouts. And that book brought about the removal of DDT. She had an audience certain bird life were threatened by the effects of DDT. Today we are threatened. But unlike in the days of Rachel Carson's, today we are confronted with the so-called psychological operations, psychops, the propaganda machine, the machine that operates at all levels to change your thinking and to modify your understanding of a situation. It's propaganda. 
And we are smothered with this. We are at a planetary crossroads. As I understand one person said, look, if you see a fork in the, in the crossroad, you stop and pick it up. But here we are, we are at the crossroads. <clears throat> I'm going to skip through this very quickly. And I've given you quite a lot of information. We don't have time to talk about it in detail. So I'm going to skip. This just documents the impact of fossil fuels on health. Who gave the polluters the right to do what they're doing? Well, unfortunately, the federal and the state regulations are so skimpy and so few that pollution can be quite dangerous, reach dangerous levels, and yet still be within the prescribed standards. Something's wrong. There's a stack over there, Lane Cove Tunnel. The Minister's conditions of approval allow 154 tonnes of volatile organic chemicals per year to come out. Benzene, toluene, xylene, etc. 154 tonnes to come out each year, along with 14 tonnes of particles. Some of you will be aware that Bob Carr's government changed the role of the public servant. And I draw your attention to this line here. They must comply with any relevant legislative, industrial and administrative requirements. The public servants are servants of the government. We found it time and time again. The bureaucrats know the truth, but if there is a political policy they have to conform to the policy. They are servants of the government. Economic rationalism. If the excise and the taxes coming in exceed the cost of health, it is justified. It is rationalised. But there's no morality. And it reduces particle numbers by 50%. The advice to the biofuels industry is never, ever give up. The lungs, very quickly, you have the gas exchange units here, the alveoli. On the left is the normal gas exchange unit. Oxygen comes in dissolves in the surfactant and it gets transported across into the haemoglobin. This is what happens here when there's inflammation. The gas exchange becomes dysfunctional. The yellow down here shows clotting occurring. The platelets are clumping. Keep that in mind very quickly. Air pollution can reduce the cell numbers in your bloodstream by causing them to stick to each other and they get sequestered in the lungs. Published information shows the impacts of that kind of pollution on lung development in young people, as well as the threat to onset of myocardial infarction. This is illustrated here. If a person has narrowed arteries supplying the heart muscle, and if they're generating clots elsewhere, as a result, say, from exposure to these irritants, these pollutants, those clots can get jammed in the narrowed vessels and then block the supply of blood, arterial blood, to the muscle of the heart. That's an infarct. Within hours of exposure to PM2.5 uh, fine particles can trigger a myocardial infarct. The other information is there for you to read. <coughs> and affects women in similar fashion. We'll skip over this. 
It's there for you to read. Asthma. Let's assume that the level of inflammation induced in the lung is represented by that threshold there. The person is allergic to house mite dust. The inflammation doesn't get there and so there's not an episode of asthma. Pollen on this occasion. Particle pollu uh, pollution, PM2.5 or nitrogen dioxide. Irritant produces inflammation. But if you add all those together, you have the patient in hospital. But if you bring this down to here and keep that constant, the person is now responding to lower doses of pollen and lower doses of house mite dust to precipitate an asthma attack. That is called hyperresponsiveness. Very quickly, and I'll have to skip over some of these uh, slides now. Fine particles can block rainfall, and you can look up the reference of that. CSIRO don't want you to know that. They're locked into this hoax of carbon dioxide and climate change. I don't support it, quite frankly. I don't. <clears throat> melatonin, very quickly, melatonin can be produced in the pineal gland as well as in other organs. In the pineal gland, it comes under the influence of light and darkness. <clears throat> Melatonin has numerous biological effects. They're there for you to look at. We don't have time. Melatonin is also able to augment the immune response. And if you block melatonin, you lose the humoral aspect of immunity. Your antibodies will drop down. That's a fact. It also inhibits the LDL receptor for the synthesis and the synthesis of cholesterol. In other words, it can moderate the levels of cholesterol. It's found in all organs of the body, but it is consumed in those tissues by mopping up free radicals. And free radicals damage the cell to the extent where under certain conditions it can lead to cell death. Graham spoke about glutathione peroxidase, which is somewhat similar but nowhere near as effective as melatonin in quenching free radicals. That's just the production of melatonin over a lifetime. It's high at early ages and then it diminishes with time. 24-hour cycle, when the sun goes down, in darkness, melatonin should go up. But it doesn't, because we have artificial light that keeps it switched off. Sheep, for example, when the sun goes down, their melatonin goes up. For us, we switch on the lights, and the melatonin doesn't go up until we go to sleep late at night. We're depriving ourselves of the benefits of melatonin. Circadian rhythm of melatonin peaks, this is the black spot, it peaks at night, oh, sorry, it, it, the melatonin rises when you go to sleep, peaking in the early hours of the morning. The levels of cortisol are the reverse. Cortisol will block, will block implantation of the fertilized ovum. We won't go into the mechanisms. Natural. Here you have melatonin switching off cortisol, a blocker of implantation. I'm going to skip over now these aspects here until we get down to... Beta blockers will inhibit melatonin very effectively. One of them is propanolol, completely switches off melatonin, deprives you of that capacity to prevent cell death. 
<coughs> beta blockers, even some of the statins can do exactly the same. Skipping over now. You're up it again. <coughs> Fluoride. I was hoodwinked some 30 years ago by our dean, the Faculty of Dentistry, who said that fluoride in our water will be the answer to caries. And he implemented a motion to cut back on dental students by 50%, from 120 student intake at the Sydney University to 60. And it did. Ten years ago, it's been documented, and I shudder at this, that fluoride in our water is blocking our melatonin. Each day, 1,600 or thereabouts persons are diagnosed with dementia, neurolo neurological degeneration. And here's another factor. Fluoride, interfering with melatonin that is needed to pre pre prevent neurological degeneration, along with all of these other factors. Okay, skipping over. You can read all of this for yourself. Pesticide toxicity. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention, finally, to this Trans-Pacific Partnership. At the very moment, there are secret negotiations to extinguish, in this country, environmental laws that prevent the multinationals coming in to exploit our natural resources. Read it up. I've given you the links there. It will allow all uh, corporations to sue nations if laws such as those protecting the environment or labour conditions interfere with corporate profits. And they're going to set up a, a private international corporate tribunal to determine these instances of breaches. So you might think that coal seam gas can be stopped by us there's a penalty. The International Tribunal can sue our country for interfering with that right which our country has agreed on free trade. But they don't talk about free trade, they talk about partnerships. Okay, finally, sorry, I will move on. <clears throat> I mentioned again this anti-fertility vaccine. And those of you who are familiar with the Agenda 21, look it up and you will be horrified. WHO is behind the policy of reducing world population from 7 billion to 500 million. They're doing it now. Tetanus toxoid is a very effective vaccine and I totally support you receiving tetanus toxoids to prevent tetanus. However, what they're doing is exploiting that now. Sorry. They're using that toxoid as a carrier for human chorionic gonadotrophin, which is a female hormone, hormone needed for pregnancy. <clears throat> and these women who are now receiving this conjugate, they develop antibodies not only to the toxoid, but to human chorionic gonadotrophin. Those antibodies prevent that woman ever becoming pregnant. And 40% of the women in Brazil are now infertile. You, you're not told that, but it's documented. In the Philippines, it's happening. Southeast Asia and Thailand, it is happening. And in Africa. Beware. There's an obesity vaccine being developed against somatostatin. 
You can read that information for yourself and check it out. The pandemic, a couple of years ago, the flu pandemic was a hoax. It was a hoax. The pandemic was manufactured by the pharmaceutical companies in league with the World Health Organization to make vast profits while endangering public health. And Dr. Wadag blocked it in Europe on the grounds that he had the facts. It was a hoax. Okay, my advice is there for you to read. Well, there is probably one of the most inspiring photographs ever taken. Simply called the pale blue dot. There it is. And the Voyager spacecraft was at that moment leaving our solar system and looking back and that's that's our home that's our home the blue marble our greatest threat today I believe is if nuclear weapons and they now have tactical nuclear weapons are let loose in a Middle East war which is which will happen it's not a question of if it will happen any day and that will threaten life on this earth the joy of creation a gardener knows holds more than the beauty of the lily and the rose a thylamitra, an orchid. Now those of you who are keen observers, and you are all keen observers, I ask you, why is that labellum, that lower petal, curled up? And the one over here is curled. And this one is only curled on one side. Well, speak to the earth, and it will teach you. It's a sun orchid. So as the sun goes down, you can see why. It's going to be enclosed by those two petals. And this one is flatter than this side because it's going to enclose the other. So it's time to close. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars, and you have a right to live. Thank you.